indeed of the development of these submissions just put in on to the Retained EU Law Act, which I always leave to my law student. I pay the view, think that it doesn't change the position from as set out in the law. I think it was my going to Harvard was clear, but in order to update my laws in the light of the delay in the appeal, I guess this is the rest of the point. And it's not, if I discuss my learning plan, it's entirely clear what happens should my laws do something different than they would, but that's in the next. Just two points of clarification in answer to the questions that were raised before lunch. The first is in relation to the way that we're putting the claim in equity. In summary, we are submitting that everything LLP did in terms of the rebranding and registering the trademarks was both in law and equity, in effect as it was. And Ms. Adams will address them further in our consequence we have tomorrow. In response to my Lord, Sir Christopher Floyd's question, in relation to the marks and where are the limits, is the way I think it was put to me. In my respectful submission, what we're looking at in a situation like this is that you have the name quantum advisory. Over time, it's put in different ways. It's effectively the start of the family tree is quantum advisory at the top. But over time, it's interlinked and interrelated marks are created to support the brand. And therefore, in my respectful submission, one should look at and speak in terms of similar meaning interlinked or interrelated. And that's the limit, what was put in a case such as this. Because otherwise, as I said, the underlying policy behind Section 10B would be undermined. Now, my Lords, after those two quick preliminary points, I'm going to deal briefly with the, what I'm calling the Marussia point, which is the point that, which is the case that the learned judge said provided the proper basis to say that equity was excluded from consideration in this case. Now, insofar as the learned judge did that, in my respectful submission, he was wrong to do it. In particular, because Marussia was concerned with a completely different and harmonized field and was nothing to do with who a proprietor was. It was all to do with questions of infringement. Now, Marussia is in AB2, Act 21. It's a decision of Mr. Justice Mayles. And it was a case involving, as described in the head note, as prevention of use. A defendant continuing to use a community registered trademark after the expiry of a license period. Whether the proprietor entirely consenting to use of the mark, whether in absence of consent, a defendant in principle is able to rely on estoppel. And my Lords will see in the holding one, the reference to Martin E. Pass diffusion, that's at the bottom. And that is the case that was relied upon in support of the finding that I shall take my Lords to now. But the relevant holding was to refusing the application that while the defense of estoppel by acquiescence was a rule of national law, which operated as a kind of deemed consent, regardless of actual consent, could be characterized as an aspect of a wider principle of good faith or abuse to rights, to allow the possibility of such a defense would mean that protection of the community trademark proprietor would be subject to issues outside the terms of the regulation and would vary according to each legal system. Now, the relevant part of the judgment is 
Uh, first, if I can take my Lord's to paragraph 84 at page 454. please. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. We have no choice, but have to reconvene in a moment. Attention, please. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area.
Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions 
of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers.
Attention, please. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please.
This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. 
Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit 
and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please. Attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. 
do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers.
and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please. Attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evac... Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run.
do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. <laughs> Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions of fire evacuation officers. Party, please. <laughs> attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Attention please, attention please. This is the incident control officer. A fire has been detected in your building. Please evacuate the building now by the nearest fire exit and go to the designated assembly area. Do not run. Do not use the lifts. Follow the instructions 
of fire evacuation officers. because we've obviously lost more time. Uh, in the short term, unless this causes anyone particular difficulties, we propose to sit to 4.45 today and start again at 9.45 in the morning. Um, is that all right? Good, we'll do that. <coughs> My Lord, thank you. <coughs> um, we, were, we were just looking at the um, Marusha case. Yes. Um, and I think we had got to paragraph 92 in the judgment, which is on page 456 of the authorities bundle uh, 2 behind tab 21. And, um, and this is really just to um, give you the context in which the finding was made. And the learned judge um, makes his finding um, at the bottom of 93. And just in, in these terms, the exclusion of national law defence was further illustrated by the Martin Parish Infusion case. Defendants sought to rely on a defence of abusive rights and curvature of law, and then goes on to set out what is, is now, um, well, um, accepted. Um, which is that Article 5 to 7 of the Directive, that's the trademark directive, affect a complete harmonisation of rules relating to the rights conferred by the trademark and accordingly define the rights of the proprietors of the trademark in the European Union. Now, my Lord, um, this case um, uh, has now been referred to on this specific point. 
by the Court of Appeal in the Mosman case. And I don't, it is, I would accept that on the state of the law as it currently is, that it is clear that Articles 5 to 7 of the Trademark Directive affect the complete harmonization of the rules relating to the rights conferred and the rights of the proprietor. But that's not the same question as to who the proprietor is. And therefore, in my respectful submission, this is beside the point here. And we've been through all the case law this morning over the title of the property and the like. This tells you, once you have identified the proprietor, these are the rights they've got that they can enforce against third parties. And there's a complete code in Articles 5 to 7 of the Directive under the equivalent law of the UK. Fine. But test it like this. If I was sued for, if a party was sued for infringement and turned around and said, you're not the proprietor, I am the proprietor, that would not be within the scope of Articles 5 to 7 of the Directive, because it's asking a different question. So in my respectful submission, the judge was wrong to find, as he did, relying on the Marussia case. Insofar as my learned friend relied on Recital 12 of the Directive, which my laws will find behind tab volume 1 of the authorities bundle, tab 5. Page 57, my laws will see the recital. Attainment of the objections of the approximated laws requires that the conditions of obtaining and continuing to hold a registered trademark be, in general, identical in all member states. Well, that may be one thing, but the question of who the proprietor is is quite another. And in particular, with that regard, I would draw my laws' attention to the Recital 40 of the Directive, which is on page 61, which says, this Directive shall not exclude the application to trademarks for provisions of law of the member states other than trademark law, such as provisions relating to unfair competition, civil liability, or consumer protection. So, insofar as there may be, or as in this case, we say, the law of property, those are not part of the harmonization. And therefore, in my respectful submission, the judge was incorrect to exclude equity in principle on the basis of the judgment in Marussia, by analogy with Marussia. It simply wasn't applicable. Now, finally, my laws, if I could turn to the next point, which arises from my skeleton at paragraph 66 on A73. And that is the judgment of Salvador Benjamin Bravo de La Guana in the court of the Salvador case. Now, I accept that this was not before the judge at the first instance, but it is of relevance. Now, I think it's better if we look, in fact, at the actual judgment, but I gave you the reference to my skeleton so you can see where it is. But the judgment is Appeal Bundle 2 at tab 22. And it's a judgment of the CJEU. And it was a reference from the Supreme Court in Spain in relation to an EUTF. And so if one sees the references here, if I 
can take my law to the head note, a reference for provision of this ruling, a regulation number 2072009, that's a regulation that relates to Canadian trade or EU trademark. And then it was this Article 16, Trademark and Object of Property, dealing with EU trademarks as a national trademark, Article 18, transfer of a trademark registered in the name of the agency representative of the trademark proprietor, national provision allowing the possibility of bringing an action for recovery of ownership of a national trademark registered in fraud of the owner's right or in breach of a legal or contractual obligation. This was my laws, the reference that I gave my laws earlier today to talk about a, pr a different provision of national law um, coming into play. So, so was I think there was a concern about you can have one, you can have a national law here and, and then worry about other places. But it, it's quite clear that national laws of different countries have a role to play. Um, there is not complete harmonisation. And so one turns the page and one gets, in the usual way, um, a recitation of the actual provision for the regulation. So you'll see Article 16, and that's dealing with the EU trademarks as a national trademark. EU trademark as an object of pro property shall be dealt with in its entirety as the whole area of the EU. As a national trademark registered in the member state in which, according to the register of trademark, the proprietor has his seat or his domicile. And, and again, that answers the question that was raised this morning in relation to what you do about a community trademark or an EU trademark. And where a point A does not apply, the proprietor has an establishment on relevant date. Article 18 is the equivalent of Article 13 in the directive and Article um, 10b, uh, and it's the wording that my laws will be familiar with. The Spanish law is identified um, in paragraph set out in um, paragraph 8, and one sees it set out there. So it's, it's a particular um, local law. So the facts are then set out to, to tell you the dispute. So on the 24th of January, um, Mr. Floacano um, filed an application for the sign. And it was registered. Now, he considered he was the lawful proprietor of the trademark, but somebody else thought otherwise, and so brought an action to recover the ownership of that trademark. Uh, now, we can see in paragraph 13 that the court dismissed the action on the ground first that the only regime in Article 18 of the regulation is applicable to EU trademarks to the exclusion of the general regime in Article 2. And secondly, that the conditions of Article 18 the regulation are not met. There was no, as I understand it, no relationship between the parties in the, in the action in the domestic court. It was. I don't believe so. <coughs> so, you can't so it's not, it was not an agency situation as we have here. No, but, but um, my lord, if, if um, you could Thank see you. the question in paragraph 19 that was referred to the High Court. Yeah. We, have, we first, in the usual way, have the findings on admissibility that we can skip over, and then we can, laws, and we can then turn to the substance of the decision, which go from paragraphs 31 through to 38. And, and my lord, in my respect of submission, what, what these holdings make clear is that Does not, ex does not preclude the application of um, national law. So, in my respect, was mentioned a matter of principle, it was not open to um, the learned judge to ex exclude equity. And Because it's an object, again, it refers to the fact that it's an object of property and should be dealt with as such. It does not preclude the application to an EU trademark of a national provision under.
under which the person harmed by the trademark registration is deprived or is broad of his rights or in breach of a legal or contractual obligation is entitled to claim ownership of that trademark. And it says, provided that the situation concerned does not fall within those covered by Article 18. So, insofar as, as, the, as the learned judge excluded as a matter of principle any application of English law to the matters before him, that was incorrect. So is that what he did, though? Or did he, did he say that this uh, case that you're referring us to was a case uh, which was not within the scope of Article 18, but his case was? Because his case involved the registration of a trademark by a person who was an agent. Well, what, what I would say, my, my Lord, what I'm trying to explain here is that it's not, whilst, and, and it's made clear in my skeleton, whilst the starting point may be um, Article 10 b there is nothing here that excludes the application as a matter of principle of the, of the law of equity. And if the judge except, had found... Except in the limited case... Except in the limited of case. Of a, a person who applies for a trademark as an agent of the true owner of the mark. But to the extent that the um, court were to find um, that, that, the, um, that the application did not fall within the scope of, if, if by reason of proprietorship or any other reason within um, Article 10b, then this provision allows that equity to take a role. It's not precluded. It's, it's not. Um, the judge took the view that in principle, whether my clients were within or without 10b, equity is excluded. And just to be clear, if we look, say, at 35, well, no, 34. So actions for recovery of ownership of an EU trademark registered in the name of an agent of the proprietor without the proprietor's authorization are governed exclusively by the regulation. So why doesn't that apply? Well, it's, it's subject, first of all, if that is the only basis on which it's put forward, that may apply. But first of all, you've got to decide, as I've explained already, equity can come in at the beginning, as it were, of the Section 10b analysis. Because it, the, how you decide whether someone's a proprietor is a matter of national law at the beginning of Section 10b. So equity has got two roles, potentially two roles here. First of all, it's relevant to decide who has the title of the trademark as a matter of English law. That's one, that's one way it can come in. The other way it can come in is if you're not within this article, for whatever reason you're not within it, there may still be scope, as a matter of principle, for the applicability of equity. And what the, what the court has done in the first instance in this case is to exclude equity completely. And how would equity operate in that scenario where it wasn't determining who the proprietor was? Well, um, if if in in the, in a case such as this, um, if it's if it's a national provision that applies to um, a case where um, a person has been harmed by the, by the registration, so where it's been applied uh, in fraud of his rights or breach of a legal or contractual obligation, he is entitled to claim ownership of that mark. So a claim properly in, e in equity can be classed as that it, it, it falls outside um, scope. We're not trying to get it to do double duty here. We accept that if you fall within Section 10b, equity doesn't need to. Leaving aside the equity to the ownership point, if we're going to equity to the relief point, I think we'll do it like that, um, we have um, expressly um, put in our skeleton that we see that equity doesn't have a role if you're already getting relief under Section 10b. But what we say the court cannot do is say it's excluded in principle um, without consideration, um, further consideration. And where it is found that Section 10b doesn't apply, then of course it needs to look and see whether there's an alternative remedy. Because it's not excluded. Um, it's not 10b, yes or no. And do you need to, do you need to say that your case in equity <coughs> covers the entirety of the ground, as it were. In other words, <coughs> do 
do you need to say that in equity, the court, ignoring Section 10b, the court should make an order rectifying the register? I didn't understand that to be your case. As I understand your case, you say equity gets you to the point where you can say you're the proprietor. At that point, you say, I'm the proprietor, and far from excluding Section 10b or doing something different from Section 10b, I'm invoking Section 10b to say that the agent's mark should be assigned or put in my name. But isn't that the way to put it, rather than to say that you put Section 10b entirely to one side and claim relief in equity? Because that would be displacing the harmonized provisions of trademark law. My lord is correct. There are the two sides, as it were. The first is that you have it in to say, I am the proprietor by reason of the law of equity under English law. And my lord is entirely right. But I also say that if for some other reason I'm found not to be within the scope of Section 10b, and I put the case on the alternative basis in pleading, then one cannot say, as the judge did below, that equity is excluded. Because this case shows that if you're outside the scope of 10b and you have a different basis upon which to seek rectification, it's not precluded by the alternative. It depends why you're outside the scope of 10b. If you're outside the scope of 10b, for example, because you fail to allege that you're the proprietor, then I'm not sure that equity does step in to assist you. Well, my lord, equity may step in to protect you. For example, if my lords are not with me on what I call the heritage family tree of points and says that mark's not caught, the court may still take the view in equity that LLP applied for as an agent and applied for the mark effectively in the shoes of my client, and therefore I should have it back anyway. That does sound like supplanting Section 10b. I'm not sure, my lord, that it is, because, as I say, it is a separate claim from equity, and it is to right a wrong, which is clearly envisaged could be possible as a matter of national law. At some stage, you might have to worry about how that claim would work. You're positing a case, presumably, where the right is not held on trust for you, because if it were held on trust for you, you'd be relying on your proprietorship. But even though there's not a trust in some other way, equity steps in and says you can have the trademark. I suspect that it would be a very rare exception, my lord. I would accept that. My primary case is that we get in, if I can put it like that, at the front end, which is that in equity, the court still holds that my client was a proprietor, and it's also the proprietor on the basis of the other findings that the court has made at first instance. The result should follow. Now, my lord, obviously, in the skeleton argument, I set out the basis upon which I say that the result should follow. I don't think that there's any need to take my lords through that, because it's precise in the facts. If I could just check for one moment. My lords, unless you've got any further questions, those are my points. Thank you very much. Mr. Hill. So I propose to deal with the LLP's appeal first, because the arguments on the LLP grounds are relevant when dealing with the court's appeal. So I'll come back to deal with my own friend's submission probably tomorrow morning in an hour. So we have raised three grounds in the skeleton argument. First, that the judge was wrong to find that the LLP was in a fiduciary relationship with the court. Second, that the judge was wrong to conclude that the LLP did not establish its own separate independent goodwill under the contractual arrangement with the court. And third, that the judge erred in ordering rectification under Section 10b in relation to the mark featuring the words quantum advisors. The third ground very much follows on from the first. So I'll start with the first ground, which is that the judge was wrong to find that the LLP was in a fiduciary relationship with the court. 
just two. Um, so I can take it uh, quite briefly. Um, and after that, I, of course, will then respond on the in relation to Quad's appeal. Starting, um, the LLP would like to draw attention to what it considers to be the highly uncommercial effect of the way the judges can do analysis of the parties' relationship uh, work. Um, the effect is that if the agreement um, is adhered to as the party is plainly intended, i.e., it lasts 99 years, or uh, perhaps more likely until the uh, legacy business ebbed away, uh, then at that, the end of that time, the LLP will be in a position where it essentially has abandoned a trademark that by then it will have established an enormous amount of goodwill. A business which survives that long is highly likely to build up a highly valuable goodwill and to store it in the relevant, in the relevant industry. Whereas at that time, Quad may not have business at all, and if it does, it's very likely to be uh, much smaller than that of the LLP business, given that the, LL the legacy business under the services agreement has significant constraints on its growth, and so is likely to waste away, as Mr. Coombs uh, well, acknowledged in his evidence during the first trial, and the judge recorded in his judgment in that trial, at paragraph 105, First volume of the authorities, tab seven, uh, page one three nine, and it was a point that Mr. Reed Jones reiterated at this trial, um, as you can see from the uh, excerpts of the transcript, which are at the supplemental bundle, tab thirty five, page B three zero four, page twenty five of the transcript, lines one to eleven. Uh, and so what, what one essentially gets is uh, a, a relationship where the true underlying purpose of the services agreement was in effect to seek to achieve a divestment of the quad business in circumstances where the LLP was unable to pay to buy that business at the outset and needed staff and assets to be able to set up on its own account. Uh, and that is what we say fundamentally distinguishes this case from that of the Dorney Day case, for example, um, which you have at the authority 11 tab 11, um, and puts it alongside the more recent case of Heyman Joyce Property and Heyman Joyce Broadway, where there were two businesses sitting alongside each other. The LLP's case is that this is a, a, a very much a bespoke arrangement where it was positively intended that there would be two businesses coexisting alongside each other, trading under the same name. And um, fundamental to that was that each business would have a different provider. And so in the case of the legacy business, that business was going to continue to be provided by Quad. But the way that business was going to be provided was through LLP providing services to Quad as explicitly provided in the services agreement. And as for the LLP, that was going to be providing business on its own account, um, to its own standards, um, where the services which the clients were going to be receiving owed nothing uh, to Quad. And so if one applies the factual approach to considering who was the origin services, the trade origin of the services. In the case of the LLP business, uh, we say, of course, it, it was the LLP. It wasn't Quad. And so factually, all of the, um, all of the clients and the, the place where the goodwill landed up uh, was um, with the LLP. And so one has a situation where, uh, unusual though it is, uh, two separate goodwill subsist alongside each other. So if I could now go to uh, ground one of our appeal. Which Just I'll... before you do, so 
I get a feeling for where we're going. Um, as we know, you, you registered trademarks in your name, uh, but you no longer maintain, as I understand it, the quad can't use those marks. So do you have a position as to what should happen to the registration? Well, we, 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 our position is that they should be, these registrations should be in PLRP's name. Um, and Quad, if so desires, can apply to its own registrations. And you can have them sitting alongside each other and have them be the uh, the butt of our uh, litigation. So peaceful coexistence, which has come about due to the parties tolerating each other. Um, <coughs> and you, you wouldn't oppose that, that registration no. on the grounds of family rights? No, no, it's implicit. It's Could the register not be rectified to um, put uh, Quad on the register as a joint owner of Goodwill? That's, that's well, in, in principle, yes, um, because that would amount to much the same thing as each, each party having their own trade. <laughs> Perhaps, but um, but so I, I mean, I mean, the principle is where you have joint owners. Each owner has the ability to uh, enforce the mark. Um, there would obviously need to be some underlying substrate relating to the the, the honest concurrent use we allege. Obviously, each side would not be able to restrain the other in their relevant field. Um, but but my my position would be yes. That's a sort of similar. Equivalent um, way of, of dealing with the issue. Now, of course, it, it's important to bear in mind that those initial letters were sent in a very different context to that which obtains now. They were sent at a time when uh, the LLP was seeking to uh, escape from what are the stringent terms of the services agreements, and uh, you may have appreciated if you've had a chance to read the BAT first document that underlying. The dispute is obviously the Batman Services Agreement uh, has a set split in terms of revenue which cannot be altered over the course of 99 years, um, which uh, in my submission does rather undercut a point which has been made throughout the, at least in some of the judgments, that these are profession, professionally drafted agreements uh, concluded by um, experienced uh, professional uh, people. Now that may be the case, but that doesn't mean that the agreements, uh, the agreement is a, is a, a work of perfection. Uh, far from it. There are, there are many aspects of the agreement which uh, do not work well, as the fact that we are now here in the Court of Appeal uh, on the third occasion uh, might be regarded as testifying. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> if, I, if I could move on to, to our first yep. appeal. Could I just ask you one other question? You, you said that they should apply for their own registration. Do you accept they'd be entitled to register each of the contested marks, including Hero Q? Uh, no, we don't, um, in relation to the Hero Q, uh, because that's been generated. Self. Why is it not the same as the other three terms of who's generated the goodwill? Well, at the moment in the in the, the case which is before the court, there is no uh, there is no specific allegation of ownership of goodwill. No, I understand that. Q. Um, now, obviously, in theory. Possible that goodwill could be built up um, by actions carried out by the LLP when conducting work for Quad in the course of the legacy business. And so, in principle, it is possible for that situation to occur in relation to other to marks that did not exist in 2007. So, if the new mark outcome of uh, a rebranding 
the side and then that's deployed for both businesses. You could end up with the same situation of concurrent goodwills existing because there are customers receiving uh, services from different trade sources alongside each other that have specific contracts with buying uh, the service from each other. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yep, thank you very much. <laughs> no. um, so you're under fiduciary relationship. So fiduciary relationship, yes. Um, So there, there is a, before I go into the detail of this, there is a question mark as to sort of the significance of this question um, for the court's decision. Uh, because uh, I think as the court may have mentioned uh, during this morning's discussions, there is no allegation uh, in the uh, particulars of the claim to the effect that here was a duty do something. It was a particular fiduciary duty, and it had been breached by the um, PLLP by going away to register the trademark, and the consequence should be uh, that they were then disgorged or transferred. Uh, and when one actually looks at the you know, the judge's judgment, of course, he, he reaches his decision based on Section 10b, which is not dependent. English law concept of fiduciary. It's been using a, a broader concept of fiduciary. And of course, the English, at least some English law of fiduciary would, would, would definitely fall within that um, concept. Do, do you mean fiduciary? You mean agent or representative fiduciary? I mean, well, it's obviously agent or representative in the language, but in, in some of the case law, they do discuss the that it's a fiduciary duty sense in nature and that's really what's underlying it's some kind of trust relationship but it goes wider doesn't it that we recognize the ability of a for example a distributor to be brought within the scope of the provision and on this appeal we're not disputing that the one gets to that that stage of the argument in Section 10b. So, so just so I understand, um, for purposes of the Act, it's clear that a distributor can be an agent or representative in circumstances where you wouldn't conclude on English law principles that there were fiduciary duties. Exactly. So they would normally be regarded as having um, arm's length uh, commercial relations. So that's a nice way to put it. Uh, and another curiosity of this section of the judgment, of course, is that it's, sort of, it's somewhat detached from the specific consideration of the content of the duties. Um, and that rather puts the sort of cart before the horse in the sense that many of the cases <laughs> discussing the general principles say that you recognize by fiduciary from their duties, um, which in most cases are going to be defined in the contract which exists between the, the relevant parties. Um, and so, in my submission, it may, it may not be very fruitful, in fact, for the court to really consider the question from the end of thinking, oh, is this a fiduciary in the first instance? Rather, what we say is the analysis should start from the starting point of the services agreed between the parties, and one should work out what, what the consequences of that are. And when one does that, um, the, the concept of fiduciary duty, we say, probably has a very different impact, because if one construes the agreement, and one sees what the duty is, and it, it says goodwill accrues to uh, all the goodwill generated under the name, whether in legacy or LLP business accrues to 
good, then obviously quod will prevail. But he doesn't say that in, in true analysis of you. The deal is he doesn't say anything about where LLP goodwill should go. Um, and as such, if one applies the approach, the proper approach we say to construction, that should mean it should go where it falls as a matter of fact. Then one has a situation such as with uh, well, I'll just come on to them on a second ground of the two separate goodwills standing inside each other. And just before you go on, you say, well, really, questions of whether or not fiduciary duties erode in the abstract may not matter very much because you have to look at what the actual duties are. Um, and that the judge in dealing with this is somewhat detached. Is the judge's treatment really a consequence of how the matter was argued before him? Yes, I think it is. Well, it's pleaded, I think, and, and maintained because it didn't focus. The case did not focus. And I, I think, the, again, this sort of feeds into the, the, uh, the warning which I cited in my skeleton article in Millet, in his article, which is in uh, authority bundle of four, five, um, uh, 1546, bundle 1546, um, that one should be cautious about turning a simple contractual relationship into a fiduciary Warning cited with approval by Lord Justice Moses in the Helmet Integrated Systems Tunnock case, um, which I think is in Bundle 3, no, sorry, Bundle 2, the authorities, Chapter 35, at page 2, paragraph. I wasn't keeping up, which tab are we? It's tab 35, the last one. Clause 7 from page 
decided to quad, the way it's phrased is the conservative is deciding to quad, not to quad clients. So this is drafted as a subcontracting arrangement, and not as a provision for agency services, which we say you know, carries some weight because of the way the courts court needs to objectively decide whether that is in fact. And then in paragraph, uh, sorry, clause 7.3, we see the standard of the services is defined objectively as uh, services provided in accordance with best industry practice, and that then the uh, LLP is given, uh, has, to, has to meet that standard, and how it meets that standard is up to the LLP. reasonably necessary. So it is allowed to choose. In 7.4, there is a requirement to comply with statutory, regulatory, and professional requirements, as well as reasonable requirements on the army of the quad. And those requirements have to be considered in good faith, but they do not have to be uh, adopted. So the LLP can decide not to adopt the, the uh, quad's uh, dictates. And then at 7.5, there is also a, a floor to the level of services provided. So the LLP cannot provide the services to a lower standard than the services it itself provides. But that is, a, we say, a lesser standard than that required of the fiduciary, who is supposed not to be judging things by their own standards, but to be looking with single-minded loyalty to, the, uh, to, to, to their client. Can I just talk around this a moment? Um, the way that the law relating to fiduciaries has developed, as one sees, for example, in the Motti case, is uh, you distinguish between, so to speak, fiduciary duty properly so regarded loyalty and standards, duties of care and the like, which are not fiduciary duties. But that doesn't mean that fiduciaries don't owe duties of care. Uh, you can perfectly well be a fiduciary and still have obligations of care. Solicitors do all the time. So might it be said, well, we see all this, we see that there are obligations as to care, but those aren't inconsistent with having a duty of loyalty as well. Well, we would say that it is perfectly possible to have um, consistent, a consistent duty that one should not fall below the standard of care, and also that one has to pursue a, a duty of single-minded loyalty. Those, that, that's, that is a logical consistent position one can have in a contract, and in order for the, the person, the fiduciary in that position, <laughs> acting as they should, they therefore have to comply with the higher in any particular set of circumstances with the higher of those two duties. I'm not sure it's necessarily higher, it's different. Well, they may be different, but sometimes they may impose a more onerous obligation, sometimes they may not. If I can pick up what the Lord says, I think duties of loyalty and duties of competence respond to quite different concerns. Duties of competence are about attaining some objective standard in, in the work you're doing. Duties of loyalty is about acting in the interests of your principal and not acting in somebody else's interest. If you agree to act for somebody else, you have to put their interests. But that's got nothing to do with competence. As, as Lord Justice Mirrod himself says in Matthew, you can be disloyal but competent, and you can be loyal but incompetent. They're just different things. They're not. They're not different standards of the same thing. That, I I agree with that, uh, but I think sometimes they can have an impact on the same acts, on the same things one's doing. Um, so uh, one could take a case where. If one is pursuing the furtherance of a business, one's 
consideration of your client's obligations, and the job of duty of loyalty in, in mind, can require you to do certain things in order to see those are the things which will most benefit the business. For example, you will appreciate your uh, business needs, and if you are loyal, you have that single minded duty of loyal, loyalty, you should pursue it. Now, that's um, that would be a different standard. Uh, it, it could be a different standard to pursuing the reasonably reasonably um, accepted <laughs> um, the standard of the reasonable professional uh, when conducting that particular business. But it may sometimes uh, coincide with it. Uh, and I think what we say about this agreement, uh, perhaps fundamentally, is that this this agreement doesn't it, it, it recognises the LLP's interest in its own business. And essentially says, if we look at, for example, 7.5, what it is essentially saying is the LP can decide what it's going to do for its own business and, and indeed for the provision of the quad business. So it doesn't have to pursue, it could it can say, well, when we're developing the LP business, we want to choose certain technology, for example, certain ways of doing things, and we want to choose them for our own reasons, because that will benefit our business um, in a way we want to develop it. And all this agreement says is, well, that's fine, so long as you comply with the professional standards, and so long as when you actually provide the services, you don't provide them at a lower level for quad than you do for the LP. The LLP in that circumstance is still able to decide from its own perspective as to what is the best way of developing in the overall provision that it's, that it's um, offering, i.e. what sort of staff do we hire, what sort of uh, ways of doing actuarial business um, will we adopt, uh, looking at it from its own perspective. And so long as it meets what is set out in this contract, in this particular set of clauses, it won't be in breach, and nor indeed will the uh, will quad be, be be prejudiced by that because it has set out here perfectly workable standards which protect it. Can I just pursue it a moment longer? The I think some people would say that the sort of duty you're talking about, a positive duty to act in the interests of the principal, isn't a fiduciary duty at all. I think that might be a debated point. Uh, at any rate, the things that most obviously flow from a fiduciary relationship are not positive duties, but uh, prescriptive things, duty not to profit, duty to not to put yourself in a position of conflict. Um, so again, one might say, well, really, this is a false dichotomy you're setting up between the positive duty to act in the principal's interests and the recognition in 7.5 that you don't have to do every, absolutely everything that you might think is in the, the, the principal's interest. The, it's a slightly different question whether the relationship is such that you don't think that there should be a no conflict rule or a no profit rule. Well, that, that may be, that, I think that, that is right. Uh, I think what's one has to bear in mind here, of course, there is um, there are two businesses being developed. So when LLP is developing its own business under the under the, the mark that was intended by the LLP, it will have its own interest in doing that. And um, I think perhaps the the key question is: Well, does that <coughs> is that permissible? Is that something which is permissible under the arrangement between the parties? And what we say it, it must be, because it was what essentially was contemplated by the very arrangements they were putting in place, which was that here it will be able to use a mark to identify its own business, to build up its own relationship. And I suppose you, you have the further question is well, does this actually jeopardize if, if the LLP tries to register? Does that actually jeopardise quads? And you heard my answer earlier on that, which is we say it doesn't, because the, the, the LP recognises that quad has its own rights in this. Um, it, it, so if you look at it that way, one has a situation where 
even if there is a duty of loyalty in the sense that the LP should not be going out there and doing things which you know, detrimental to the uh, to call its business what we say here is that what it has done in relation to the establishment of, those business, of its own business is not <laughs> such an act but that it's what was in in intended by the parties and indeed what actually happened uh, under that arrangement between, between the two of them is that they built up this separate um, relationship with their own individual clients and for the DLP to seek to protect that through its own uh, trademark is a perfectly legitimate thing. It would be different if it actually did jeopardise, potentially different, if it did jeopardise for us, but it's recognised by the LP that it, it can't. So just talking around that for a moment longer, um, uh, plainly a fiduciary relationship conventionally carries with it a no conflict principle. Um, uh, you say at least that it is perfectly obvious from the arrangements in this case that uh, that didn't prevent you using uh, the marks for your own purposes. Yes. Um, I suppose that might not, is that a conflict? I, suppose, <laughs> I don't know. Um, you're, you're dealing with separate clients. That's, um, and in fact, yeah, I think the party's intention was that it would be reinforced. of the LLP in building its own clients under the mark would tend to improve, the, enable it to offer improved services as a provider to support those services. Uh, and of course, quite, I haven't quite understood that. Uh, it's not going to get any new legacy clients. The legacy clients is a fixed and, and diminishing pool. There, there is some scope for them to be expanded there's, there's, according to certain principles. There's, there's pipeline people and, yeah. and so on and so forth, and, and new schemes Systemic. for existing employers. But, yeah. but in principle, um, LLP is, is not building more business, new clients for the for the quad. It's it's managing existing clients for the quad. So keeping clients. Yes. Yeah. So in what way will its success or failure? building its own clients affect the business it does for Quad? I haven't quite understood, which I think is what you said. Well, I, I, the, way, the way it can work is if LLP is very successful, builds up highly skilled staff, good technologies, um, that then rebounds on the I way see. it can cater for the legacy business and makes the legacy clients less likely to move elsewhere. I see. Thank you. And um, if I could just go on to, to just wrap up this point, um, the first ground. The other, uh, I've set out in paragraph 34 of our skeleton, other factors which we say point away from the agreement accepting its fiduciary relationship. Um, and so, first of all, we've got Clause 8.1, which uh, specifically restricts the powers um, conferred upon the LLP and, and states that it, the LLP shall have no power or authority whatsoever to bind or commit Quad. Um, and that, we say, is its subtle points away. Just, so just pausing there, sorry, my lord, go, go first. Well, I was going to say, is, does it matter? Uh, I mean, lots of people who undoubtedly are fiduciaries don't have authority to enter contracts for their principles. The obvious one is an ordinary routine convincing solicitor has no authority to sign a contract of purchase or sale for the client, but undoubtedly is an agent of the client in all sorts of other ways, communicating with the other side, etc., registering title and the like, and undoubtedly goes fiduciary duties to a client. Does the, the lack of authority to commit the client 
matter. Um, in my submission, again, one needs to focus actually probably on the specific content of the fiduciary duty which might make a difference in this case, i.e., one which would require that dealings with the marks would be subject to prioritising. Um, In, the, in that context, we say that these list of points do sort of all form together <laughs> to point away from it being that sort of relationship. Um, and they very much a subsidiary to the overall commercial thrust of the deal in the first place, which you say is to establish a separate business with the LLP under the mark in circumstances where that business, the legacy business, is liable to be giving away in 99 years, it would be, if anyone was standing, it would be likely to be the LLP. So just uh, before you move on, um, uh, I think it's suggested in um, Quad Skeleton, well look, whatever it says, it close, I'm not, I'm, this is probably not quite what they say. But this is sort of what I understood from the point. Whatever it says in clause 8.1, actually, you must be making contracts for LLP because um, when a client wants the digital service and you agree to provide it, that must affect Quad's position. Now, is that right? Well, it's. It, it, I think it, it, it has perhaps changed over time. So there was a time when, obviously, at the beginning, Does handle all contractual relationships with the clients. Um, for example, I think you referred to, I think it's in the notes, and the, there's the tendering case. So, tendering is the responsibility of Quad, but Quad monitors and sends out the, uh, the records. And so, I think in practice, at some stages, there was very much. So, so the, or if you were reconciling this with clause 8.1, it would be on the basis that, in effect, Quad had consented you to you, LLP, doing certain things for it at an earlier stages, but no longer were now. Yes, yes, I think that's, that's fair. Um, uh, also, there are, there are other mechanisms in this agreement which point to Quad having an ongoing strong ability to monitor what's going on and also duties to actually intervene in the business and for example to set prices to to tender which point away from a a sort of thoroughgoing um, proposal of trust in the LLP. Now I take my Lord Lord Nietzsche's point that of course one doesn't have to be a sort of across the board fiduciary and that uh, very much it can be limited to particular areas. But in respect of what we say is the core area here about the development of the um, effective businesses, we say that that points away from this being regarded as a fiduciary relationship where the LP all of its work in relation to use of the trademark has to be regarded as being carried out literally for the benefit Can I understand a bit more about how this works in practice? Quad doesn't have any employees, it just has a board of directors. That's what we were told. You took over through a 2P transfer all the employees when, when the services agreement was started. So we have a, a, a number of legacy clients who have largely pension schemes. Pension schemes need a whole lot of services on an ongoing basis. And quite apart from any system of retendering, just an ongoing relationship will require involved the trustees of a scheme 
asking their actuary or their investment advisor or their administrator, whatever it is, can you do this for us? Well, quite often, there'll be an annual fee which will involve so much work, but there'll be extra work for which there'll be an extra charge. You know, there's a triennial valuation cycle which involves various things, but you might want a valuation out of cycle for which the actuary will expect to charge separately. What happens with legacy cars? Well, the, the actuary we know is employed by LLP, but the business is quads. So the, the client says to the actuary at a trustee meeting, could you do, how much will it cost to do a bit of out of cycle valuation? The actuary has to produce a price. Is that something that is left to LLP to arrange and do and just do, or, or does it all go back to the quads directors to, to look at? But historically, So there is a sort of day-to-day -day supervision by Quartz Board of well, there, there new, a, new instructions? That's there's an ability to supervise under the agreement. There's a right to the information. There's, the Court has the ability to hire people if it so desires to uh, carry out the monitoring. Obviously, it's an exceedingly large sums of, of, of revenue uh, for the arrangement. And, and so under services agreement, we say that this was a case where if it, if it did decide not to exercise, exercise its, its rights as a, as a monitor to involve itself, that was a matter of its own choice uh, and doesn't affect essentially the uh, legal analysis of the relationship between the parties. But the fact that you have a right to monitor and supervise doesn't necessarily... You see, the case, as I understand it, that you're facing, the, what the judge found was Quad handed over its business to LLP and LLP ran its business for it. And he has that phrase about Quad had no hands or eyes. It, it's all being done by LLP personnel, both for itself and for Quad. And in relation to the Quad business, the legacy client, Quad is therefore entirely in the hands of LLP as a practical matter, whatever its theoretical right, to supervise and intervene and monitor. And that's why he says it's a fiduciary relationship, because it's a classic case where one person is managing the affairs of another. And, and I'm just trying to see how much you agree with that and how much you disagree with, 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 well, with I the premise. Well, I, what, what I would say is that if you have decided to agree certain terms about the, the, the nature of the relationship between you, and one party chooses not to exercise its contractual rights to monitor, to give directions, to um, essentially supervise the business, that cannot, um, we say, actually change the nature of the parties' agreed relationship. Just a very particular point. I remember there's been reference to what happens about pricing. I can't remember where in the agreement that is. I'm not sure I've ever tracked, looked for it. Get a percentage of whatever is charged, yes, and therefore you want to make sure that quad charges proper prices. I see. Further 
further, under the agreement, there is also, the board has the ability to uh, maintain communications with clients. Um, so the fact that it may not have exercised this detail, again, uh, doesn't alter the intrinsic relationship between the parties and the board of directors. They could decide to run aspects Also, we point to the, the exit regime in clause 13 in schedule 9. Again, I haven't looked at this, so I would be grateful to be taken to it. So clause, clause 13, which is at A220, sets out the high level the end of the agreement. And this is a, <laughs> these are obligations which were not uh, complied with um, rigorously at the beginning of the agreement. Um, and Schedule 9, A248, sets out uh, more detailed they specifically deal with, um, which is relevant to this context, is the, how one deals with the assets which are used by the LLP um, in respect of the quad business, but also in the case of non-exclusive assets in respect of the LLP business. Non-exclusive assets uh, on termination uh, do not uh, get passed to uh, to quad, but by clause six point three on a two five four, the LP is to procure a non-exclusive perpetual royalty free license. Sorry, so that was clause 6 point. 6.3. So in our submission, this would apply to, for example, the trademark, which is developed by LLP and is used for both legacy and LLP business. And after, if it's, if Ford requires the continued use of that, So we say this is important because it, it sets out a specific machinery to deal with how such assets um, should be uh, catered for. Can I just take it a case that hasn't happened? Um, there's an ability on the part of Quad to terminate the agreement in the event of various insolvency proceedings. Yes. Um, that could have happened more or less immediately, in principle. Uh, and then, on this hypothesis, uh, LLP might have been in the hands of um, 
liquidators who wish to maximize returns for creditors. Um, uh, then we have a trademark which has been used both for the purposes of the legacy business and for LLP's own business. Um, now one might think, well, in those circumstances, the last thing that Quad would want would be the liquidator um, trying to do anything with the trademark, which was important to Quad's business. Um, and uh, it wouldn't want either uh, to have the same mark used both for its own business and for any other business. Um, how would that fit into the scheme? Well, it's, it's not what the scheme provides. You know, this is an, an unusual agreement, and it's, it's, a, it's a highly relevant point, which is that obviously in most license agreements where someone lends their, their mark um, to a licensee, they explicitly provide that all goodwill is going to accrue to the licensor, and they will put in clauses which cater Explicitly to the license to terminate in the event of uh, in the event of insolvency, but that isn't what this agreement does. This agreement doesn't have anything which explicitly deals with um, intellectual property or trademarks as uh, specific assets. Um, rather, it has one might say sort of hoped for the best. <laughs> fashion what uh, one might regard as a, a, an imperfect solution. So there would be a case where if the agreement collapsed at the very beginning, you could get a situation which would be harmful to court. Now, in practice, that's unlikely to have happened because at the very beginning of the agreement, of course, there was a major overlap between all the people involved. Uh, and at the beginning, it would have been the legacy larger and more dominant business and therefore would be in a position to have sort of market sway um, over the LLP business. And so in practice, if, if that ever occurred, Quad's position probably would not be that bad. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's not, they haven't set out a straightforward arrangement. But equally, when one looks at it at the other end of the equation, <laughs> which is when one looks at, well, what's What's this agreement aimed at? What's the end game of the agreement? What are the parties hoping for and intending to happen? Um, that is essentially the passage of the business over to the LLP and the payment over time to Quad for what Quad has done in establishing the starting point of the business. And from that perspective, we say that the, the end result of this makes sense. Again, provides for a situation where um, it's imperfect, but it's where LLP, we say, has a right to continue, but also Quad uh, could potentially have a small, have a right which conflicts with that. So essentially, it's sort of rough, roughly the smooth for both sides. So, if after twenty years the the, the services agreement was terminated, that there are provisions or terminate. Under those provisions, by which stage LLP's own business is much larger than Quad's. What happens to the trademark in your, on your in your submission? The LLP keeps the trademark. Quad also has. So, yes, you have a you have a situation of of two people alongside each other, which would be uncomfortable, undoubtedly. Um, but that's the only way. What one recognition, we say, of what the end, the intent of the party's overall relationship is, which is to move to a, a situation where at the end, essentially, LLP is a standing business, and Quad has been paid off over time um, for, for, for essentially giving the, the, the leg up by providing the, the, the staff and assets at the beginning. So, so just proceeding that a moment longer, the the paying off of Quad, you say, is because you provide all these services at cost. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so for potentially 99 years, you're going to be providing services at cost uh, in return for getting the leg up, as you say. 
Um, now, the fact that it, the agreement has that feature makes my ne next question unrealistic, which was to try to work out how far it's essential to your submission that there is this dualism. Uh, in other words, suppose this were a freestanding agreement and it hadn't been envisaged that you were going to carry on your own business as well. Well, you wouldn't have agreed to provide the services at cost. But ignore that for a moment. Um, if you just had the services agreement, um, on the basis of the submissions you're advancing, you might say, well, look, still, you look no further than the agreement. Or alternatively, you might say, well, look, even, even if in that circumstance, one might conclude that there's a fiduciary relationship with relevant duties, it's a bit different here because it was always envisaged that there would be this dual setup. Well, that, that, is, that is what we say, and that's actually why I was saying at the beginning that the question of whether it's a fiduciary relationship may not be is probably the most significant one because it, it's a fiduciary relationship conditioned by the actual understanding of the services agreement and the, the parties we're getting into, which is that the two business will run beside each other. Uh, and so in that circumstance, that's essentially could be viewed as parties agreeing to things that might potentially conflict with each other. I can understand that parties could contemplate um, operating side by side whilst bound together by the services agreement. But it seems to me it's quite a difficult uh, submission to say that once it's all terminated, that the parties contemplated that there could be two companies operating in exactly the same scheme who would be competing with each other for potentially for the same pension business, going to the same company and saying, we are both quantum advisors. I mean, how does that, how does that work commercially? Well, the, the only way that works, the way that works commercially. Fusion in the market. First of all, the practical expectation is that at the end of the arrangement, that will not be happening. Well, not, it's not if it's terminated earlier. That, that's true, well, not if it's terminated earlier. But, but is that because it. over 99 years, you expect the legacy business to dwindle to nothing? That's, yes, and, and certainly the, the um, LLP business will be much more substantial. But my understanding is that the 99 years point it was for a long time contemplated it would be a much shorter period, 10 years, I think. And it was only extended to 99 years for a quite different reason. And I now can't remember what that was. It wasn't what are we going to do about the competing businesses when the license comes to an end. It was about something else. So th is that just a happenstance of it being that, that long? Well, what, what was in the parties, what was a, sort of a, a, a debate during the discussion? What you do at the end of the year. Yeah. And, so, and when we, we can come to the email tomorrow, I mean, but what we get to, um, no one, no one really knew what would happen essentially. <laughs> but they threw up that you know, it was mentioned. Well, there's going to be there could be a problem because you could have two parties. The LLP might have to stop. The legal impact might there might be a legal impact. But it's clear from the emails that no one actually knew what the impact would be. And one of the suggestions, obviously, was raised, well, we don't want to have to have another retendering, a new agreement, essentially, after 10 years. Um, and so, so, yeah, so, so basically, to get rid of that, that problem, that what you've got two, two problems at the end of the 10 years. One is, um, LLP might be in difficulty having to rebrand and something like that. The other is Quad may be stuck with the legacy business in a position where it's not able to get rid of it essentially. Um, it's sort of it, its bargaining power is very weak because it doesn't have any staff um, and essentially in order to guard that you then have to get a proper exit plan which actually if you look at the exit plan provisions is never fully finished and so those clauses contain for example a definition of a, a termination period which sorry, a capitalized <laughs> phrase of a termination period which is not defined so it's not actually clear entirely what it's meant but the reason it was never 
is it really just a case of the parties putting it off for so long they won't have to worry about it for many years? That that certainly is one of the it is is an underlying factor, but I think it also says what ties in with that though is the expectation that if you put it off for that long and you have a you have a that it may see, it may cease to be a problem. That's essentially you're dealing with the the legacy business by putting it off that long. You're basically uh, working on the these days the essential assumption that that will be dwindling. If, if, if there, there was some evidence as to how many clients you expect to lose from the legacy business, you lose half your half, well. That was what Mr. Coons of, of Quad um, said. What did he say? You lose half your half, half it over fifteen years. I think actually has not been entirely borne out, but um, but that was what was he said he, he thought. So if you if you started with a hundred clients, how many would you have left at the end of one hundred ninety nine years? Financials, not very many. No. And um, so. <laughs> I think when one, when one thinks about it, of course, also in terms of the sort of the reaping of the rewards <laughs> from the perspective of Quad, um, you've got a long period of reaping the rewards for what you've put in at the beginning. <laughs> and as yes, but, goes yes but, but as the numbers diminish, the cash they get from, from the arrangement goes down and down. And eventually it will get to a stage where it's not, it's not worth keeping it going. That's correct. That's correct. But and um, but it's important to we would say it's important to factor in that the the sort of as it were the the value fed in by quad at day one is obviously going to be greatly diminished <laughs> as time goes by. I where in this circumstance of this business the actual um, sort of content. Many years down the line, whether those clients remain sort of with the with the legacy business is going to owe less and less as time passes to what came at the beginning. And uh, I suppose on your case, you, you say, well, the cash might fall and fall over ninety nine years, but then Quad does extremely well in year a hundred when you have to buy the intellectual property rights. Well, that's that's exactly that's that's, that's the that's the the great unfairness, <laughs> which is if if you go down the route of saying you can't have two goodwill inside each other, then that means that Ford can apply for a trademark, and even if in fact even if the business the legacy business died, it would have the trademarks which control the overall business at the end, and uh, essentially it would get a windfall. It would be in a ransom position, which yeah. you might not or might not pay. You might just decide to rebrand. You might do, but that is obviously that there's a cost a involved. There's a cost involved for that, and it's really significant. If you, you know, hypothesis your brand has, has built up 99 years of uh, valuable goodwill, you might decide to reluctantly uh, forego it at that point if you have to. Um, and that we say is sort of essentially what our, our principal point really. Well, it seems to me, speaking for myself, that, that much of this argument. Really, it doesn't matter whether there's a fiduciary duty or not, because your argument is even if, in some sense, you're fiduciaries, even if you owe duties of loyalty in some sense, those cannot be such as to prevent you from exploiting the goodwill and the mark which you have built up over the 99 year period. So that, 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 that's, a, that's a slightly different argument from saying we're not fiduciaries at all. That it is, it's, it, it's in essence our second round of appeal. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I think as I said, we the first ground may not have that much significance um, in, in the context of the review. You know, you know there, there are broader potentially there are broader ramifications to the characterisation of the relationship as being a fiduciary relationship, um, and so we would invite the court to be cautious about. You'd quite like us to say it's not a fiduciary relationship at all. 
Well, we would, <laughs> but, but in a way, it's, it, if the focus of this case is very much on what matters for this case and not on other duties which might be characterised as fiduciary or not, which we would say don't decide it for the purposes of this case, then that is also <laughs> um, something that my client um, would urge the court to adopt. fiduciary relationship in place, and I don't think the court is going to do that, but that, that has been something which has surfaced in the other decision made in, in, in the other judgments, the, the, the frame um, used for, uh, the, wrongly we say, for trying to expand the, the nature of the obligations that have been imposed on the amount of the um, I think that's probably all I have to say on First ground, so it may be convenient if I yes. pick up and I'll probably refine what I would say on the second ground if I am able to have it ready. Um, in terms of timing, uh, I think I'm making pretty good progress, but I'm not necessarily sure we say we need to start starting from July. So let's just work out a realistic estimate. <laughs> um, how long do you think you will need to be tomorrow? Um, I think. Mind myself of the time here, but I think an hour and a quarter. Um, yeah, so I think the timetable is that I would be done at 11.30 tomorrow, so um, at the top of the 10, if that makes sense. If you're reasonably confident that 10 no, o'clock will confident. do it, <laughs> then um, I'm, very confident that I'm sure that's your success. Yes. Um, in which case uh, we'll break there and we'll start again at 10 o'clock in the morning.